Welcome to the Conversation Lab. I'm Don Schaefer. If you've ever been a little bit curious about how a radio station works, you're going to love this conversation with Barry Rook. Barry's the executive director of the NCRA. That's the mostly English campus community and indigenous radio association in Canada, dedicated to supporting over 126 radio stations across the country. So can you tell us a little bit about the NCRA and ANREC? Yeah, the National Campus and Community Radio Association. Uh, ANREC is the French version of that. Um, not properly translated, if I recall correctly, although I'm unilingual myself. As an organization, we've been around since 1986. We currently have 126 radio station members. These are all independent, not-for-profit radio stations. They either have a campus or community radio license or have an indigenous license or are working towards one of those. The real premise behind it all is the classification uh, under the CRTC is really about volunteer driven, not for profit radio stations. Um, so we're a collective of those. The organization itself got started before 86. It actually started with our national conferences back in 1980. So we've had more conferences than we've had years. And we're excited to have our 41st conference this coming year in Calgary. So as an organization, we're really here to, to try to help radio stations do what they do, which is serve the local community. So for us, providing information around training and educational options, Things like lobbying and advocacy, which I'm sure we'll touch a bit more about. Um, we have services. So we have a music distribution portal. There's over 26,000 songs from Canadian artists available for radio stations to access. And that's growing by about 200 a week. And that program also has a syndication distribution system. So there's about 50 radio stations or radio shows that are syndicated on a weekly basis as well. So those are just a couple of the things that we do. And our job is to try to help radio stations do whatever they need to do to hopefully not just survive, but thrive and support the communities that they service. I was on your website and you've got quite a roster of well-known people that have volunteered at stations across the country over the years. Um, any stories you can share or observations? Yeah, we're really sort of a, a starting place for a lot of individuals and, and people that have gone on to very famous spots, um, whether it's uh, media backgrounds, radio specifically, or into things like arts and culture, uh, creating festivals, etc. So there's a list on our website. It's uh, quite a few pages long of, of alumni. And, you know, people like Sheila Rogers uh, was our recent guest at our past uh uh, national Awards show. Bob Cole is alumni, Adrian Arsenault, Dan Aykroyd, Joe Bowen. They're all examples of individuals have sort of come through our sector in one form or another. Uh, and I would say quite a few members of Parliament and those in the Senate also have a background in media. And at some point, you've probably touched on one of those sort of places and spaces before. So it's great to, to see all of those individuals that have come into the sector um, through what we do to go on and have some really strong careers, but also sort of the opposite too, as people retire from commercial broadcasting or in different ways, they tend to find their way back to campus or community radio stations because you know the the radio is so much ingrained in them that when you have a bit of free time well what better to do than spend that free time talking to others about what you love and, and what the community offers and so on so we see a lot of people sort of work their way back into the sector as well which is great i read somewhere that you started at a community radio station at 15 can you tell us a little bit about what called you to radio then and now yeah, I, I got started at CFRU at the University of Guelph radio station, Radio Griffin there when I was 15. The short answer of it was I was making music under a, a name called DJ Amps. And uh, a friend of mine in Toronto said, hey, DJs don't make music, they play music. Why don't you come play music on my radio show? I thought that was great. My mother thought taking a, a train or a bus to do a, a radio show that started at 11 o'clock at night in downtown Toronto on my own was not really a great idea. Um, so he suggested I, I look into the local radio stations because there were stations all over the place. So I hadn't really had any exposure to radio uh, from there. Uh, two weeks later, I launched my own radio show. And uh, I did that show for 
uh, close to 20 years. It still lives on. It's over a thousand episodes. It was syndicated um, on about 30 stations across the country and uh, really happy that uh, a different friend of mine from Toronto, Sean Savage, now runs Amplified Radio uh, and that network and keeping that alive. So why do you still do it? Why do I still do radio? Yeah. Uh, easy answer is great people. It's it's a place where I've had a lot of opportunity to experience a variety of things. So I went to school for radio TV broadcasting out of college or out of high school. It was, do you want to get into accounting or radio? And I didn't really love money, so I went into nonprofit radio and, uh, you know, been doing it ever since, but really happy to the fact that it's all sort of circled back. So I never was very, you know, good in, you know, like sales or, or on air personality or any of those sort of angles. But what I think I've been strong with is the ability to bring people together and, and help to support what others do. So as an association, that's a lot of what we do. And, it makes it for a very rewarding day to be able to to talk to people, to be able to help out at the local level, at the national level, uh, and really give often a place for people who don't normally have a voice to be able to share their stories, whether it's something they're passionate about, like music, something they're fighting for, like social issues, or even just a place for people to come together and, and talk about what they can do for their community and develop uh, and grow their community in dozens of different languages all across the country. It's great. So I'm curious, what's the hardest part of your job representing 126 radio stations? Besides uh, the fact that it's a very under capacity uh, sector in the sense of, of capital, I think the hardest part that we have is is trying to get known and recognized and, and respected for the work that we're doing. That's changed a lot since I got started at the NCRA. Um, when I started here in 2015, we were relatively unknown. We would talk to a member of parliament or, or someone else and they go, oh, so you're the... Uh, you know, the late night hippie B-sides at two in the morning type group. And and that's sure, there's a little bit of that. But in reality, many of the, the areas and the groups that we service and support are, are often the only source of news or information in their local region. So it becomes really critical to be able to help support it and sort of grow all of that as well. Can you talk a little bit about how you see the difference between uh, the private sector and the public sector? Yeah, that sort of leads into a lot of the changes that have happened in Bill C-11. And I'm sure we'll talk about that in a bit. But radio, uh, thanks to a gentleman named John Harris Stevenson back in, in the 80s when the last Broadcasting Act was updated, had three pillars of broadcasting. John Harris Stevenson did incredible amount of work within our sector to help get ours recognized. And in the Broadcasting Act, it literally says there are three pillars, commercial, public, and not-for-profit, community-based driven programming. Beyond that, there's nothing else that's in that act. And as as of today, because Bill C-11 hasn't changed, the Online Streaming Act hasn't, been, uh, hasn't reached uh, royal assent yet, that's still the case. We are simply a one or two words in the whole thing. That has changed with the work that we've put into place, and it has sort of recognized our value and our importance. When you're talking with commercial broadcasters, they often recognize and understand that there's just not space um, or opportunity in some communities to have a successful organization that generates profit for their their shareholders or their owners. It's it's very much a business for a lot of these organizations, and that's what we're seeing when you know people buy other companies and amalgamate and and um, you know syndicated programming and. You know, some of these communities that had radio stations five, 10 years ago technically have a radio station, but there's there's nobody there. There's nobody on the ground talking about things. The CBC has this great mandate to be able to support what Canadian culture does, sharing information to all Canadians, reaching the ears, the ability to reach the ears of everybody. That's great, but they're not going to be able to reach the small town in Kilauea or one of the mountain areas in BC or Seaside FM, which is in the Eastern Passage just outside of uh, Halifax, because they don't have those types of resources. And if you looked at how much funding that organization already gets federally, they are 
20 times funded uh, what happens in, in radio for what our, op, our members do on average. We have the ability to reach local, to reach information and news that nobody else does. So, you know, we're complementary in that that grouping of all three. And I think that's one of the main reasons why uh, C11 has seen an expansion of what we're designed to do, um, being put down on paper and the importance and the relevance of that sort of coming through in legislation as the times change. I'm sitting in the downtown east side at CFRO, which is co-op radio, which is Vancouver's community radio station. Is there a difference between what we do or how we're licensed and how CITR, which is the campus radio station at UBC, is licensed? Um, in the CRTC's eyes, there is very, very little difference. Uh, the only difference between the two is that a campus station is almost always funded by students or student fees, not all the time. Sometimes the universities or the colleges pay to have a station operational in the way that it does so that they have services for the community and uh, uh, learning opportunities and so on. But in general, there's just that small difference there. Commercial st or, uh, campus stations have a restriction for what they call hit music. Uh, so only 10% of songs can be popular songs. Community stations don't have that restriction. That was designed so that Student associations didn't sort of come in and just make their own, you know, hit music radio station. There's there's already people competing in that angle. That's not what they want. They want another alternative. And then the amount of involvement from the university or the college and the faculty and the staff side of things is also there. So that on the board of directors, there's a mandated requirement to have not only community members, but have students sit on the board and have faculty sit on the board. So the combination of how the board of directors, which is the volunteer governance of the organization, is composed is different. Beyond that, they hold the same sort of principles around um, you know, what their goals are, how to support communities and so on. It tends to be that some campus stations are a little bit more on the programming side. They're a little bit less focused on an overall sound and more focused on trying to get as many voices of different sort of experiences on the air at the same time to share those stories. So, you know, in a community where there are no radio stations, you'll find a community station that in many cases sounds very similar to a commercial radio station. They're trying to provide a service for everything there. They're trying to get as many listeners as possible, uh, share the news, advertising opportunities, etc. You look at downtown Toronto, Toronto Metropolitan University, there's a lot of opportunities for you to consume radio in different ways. But what you don't hear are voices from you know, uh, Syrian refugees that have their own radio show. There's not a show that's from, you know, the University of Guelph radio station that focuses on Latin American uh, communities where more people listen online than they do uh, down there than they do in person in the broadcast range. CHRY, Vibe 105 has an incredible online stream with a urban alternative flavor, which again, there are no commercial broadcasters in the country that play that type of music. So often those campus stations are able to provide some really unique and niche programming because nobody else does it or wants to do it. Can you talk about stations that maybe stand out for the work they do? One that comes to mind for me is CKUA. You could name a province and an area, and I can tell you something unique about each and every radio station. They all have their own sort of fit into where, where they are. Um, you mentioned CKUA. Interesting example. They are a charitable organization with a commercial license, so they don't even fit ah. into the campus and community okay. model. I did not know that. I always thought they were part of the University of Alberta. Hmm. No, they've always been that sort of network broadcaster. Okay, good to um, know. So if we're looking at, let's just take Calgary for an example, uh, CJSW is the University of Calgary radio station, incredibly popular in their area, even though CKUA has you know, uh, their main headquarters in, in the city. Well, there, and they split between Edmonton. But we have, you know, a tiny little station in Nanton 
Alberta, which is located about half an hour outside of the city, that's just getting started up, right? And their focus is a lot different than what the CJSW does, but they all have really valuable importance to it. I'll give you another little example. In Montreal, there is the station at McGill um, has a focus on sort of spoken word, social work, community development, CJLO at Concordia, their focus is a little bit more on the music side of things. So they're complementary to each other within a community that has such a large amount of diversity uh, around it. So there's a lot of those little bits and pieces. We've got radio stations that are located in railroad cars. We've got radio stations that are located in the Lower East Side of, of Vancouver in very... Like ours. Right. Yeah. Um, we've got radio stations that are, you know, connected and are the only ones broadcasting local live information all across Newfoundland. And, you know, there was a story that came out about a year ago. All the commercial radio stations no longer operate in Newfoundland outside of St. John's, except our five stations. So even that is an important connection to the community that we can service. There are radio stations in Corner Brook and other spots, but they're just relaying broadcasting information and programming that comes from the capital city, as opposed to talking about what's in their area. So it's really a mix of all those different types of things. And as you sort of go from station to station, uh, it's kind of like kids, you you know, you have your, your favorite. So what's the magic of those stations? Is it the, the local participation that holds it together? It's, it's exactly that. It's, uh, I had a morning show and I talked about what was happening with the mayor because uh, I went to a city council or we heard the discussion and there's these new changes that are happening. And then later in the afternoon, the host is, you know, in the grocery store and people come up and say, I, I heard you earlier on today. Uh, what were your thoughts on this? I, I, did you talk about that? Maybe this would be a great idea. It's that, that connection that, you know, we live in a place where it's more and more difficult to create those types of personal connections. We're really seeing that with the influence of technology. You know, there's large radio programs and networks that are talking about using artificial intelligence to create hosting at the local level. That's the big move right now. And what does that mean for sharing information and creating those personal connections? So I think that's sort of one of the areas that we excel in is the fact that when someone is talking about something, you know you're going to be getting a, an opinion that's rooted in fact, uh, rooted in information, and rooted in the local and the hyper-local, or even the genre-specific. They're experts in what they offer, and they're all doing uh, presenting this information because they have that knowledge and they know that their community wants to, and that's what they love to do. Yeah, I think the magic for me has always been local, local voices, local connections. By the way, this radio program and podcast is called The Conversation Lab. I'm Don Schaefer, and today we're speaking with Barry Rook. Barry is the executive director of the National Campus and Community Radio Association that looks after 126 member stations across Canada. I'm curious about your comment regarding funding for campus stations where they can rely on student fees for part of their funding. What about community stations like ours that don't have that opportunity and have to rely on grants and fundraising, and I guess in some cases, uh, commercial advertising? It's And it's challenging too. So we've been seeing some changes. We just had some local numbers uh, come out. Every year, the CRTC requires each licensed radio station to submit some data. We ask all of our members to send it to us, so we analyze that data as well. From just before the pandemic, 2019 to now, We've seen local advertising drop in, in the amount of uh, local revenue that's coming forth. It still makes up more than half of the revenue that's generated by radio stations, which is local ads. And of course, this is incredibly important when you're talking about communities that don't have any other services. So um, CJPE is Prince Edward County in Ontario, a relatively seniors focused area. There is no other media in the area. How do you know what's on sale, what's happening around town? 
all those other types of things. So very, very important for that. So they are able to sell a lot of local ads, but also work with other types of sponsorship and and, and partnerships as well. Um, you mentioned student levies. They're usually assigned with a student who's going to that college or university. They pay a small amount per semester combined that gives enough revenue, usually for the radio station to hire some staff and, and create sort of that programming and that content. Stations often have membership drives or fundraising drives uh, where you'll reach out and you'll ask listeners to donate or to become a member. Becoming a member of a community radio station means you are, in essence, one vote of a democratic process to elect who it is that runs the station. You elect your board of directors from within your membership. Those board of directors create the governance structure and set forth the, the plan and the actions in which in most cases, staff then execute those goals. So there's that. And then you get into some of the other areas. So there is national advertising, uh, hugely increased during the pandemic, um, relatively gone now. So we're back to sort of pre-pandemic levels, although our local sales haven't returned. So we're, as a sector, facing a, a financial crunch in the next year or two. Um, there are some government grant funding uh, available, whether it's funding through programs like New Horizons for Seniors, if you're focused on seniors programming, Canadian Heritage has an amazing project called the Local Journalism Initiative, but these are not radio specific. So they're sort of on a case by case basis. We help with the stations to get those, those grants and applications, and sometimes we facilitate our own. There's also what's called the Community Radio Fund of Canada. We're we're one of three associations, uh, the NCRA, then there's one in Quebec that's French-based and one outside of Quebec, which is French-based, the OLMC, Official Language Minority Communities. Combined, the three associations of ours helped to launch what was called the Community Radio Fund of Canada. Funding uh, for that organization comes through what's called Canadian Content Development Funds, or CCD. CCD funds are tied to commercial broadcasters. The theory behind this is unless somebody is helping to pay for the base level of what goes into radio, then it's not going to be developed on its own naturally. So this is the organization that was primarily started funding Factor. So the organization that helps fund artists to create music and content. So the radio station pays some royalties to the artist who gets on the air, but they also pay Factor to help develop those artists to get on the air. In uh, 2007, 2008, we argue that, well, we provide uh, a very important service and network and we need some, some funding as well. So a small portion of revenue from CCD goes towards community radio stations and campus radio stations through the Community Radio Fund of Canada. There's two types of funding for that. One is which is your regular, you know, percentage of money made. And as you could probably guess, revenues from radio stations are not really growing. They're sort of declining. So there's less and less money that goes into that fund every year. The other was the transactional option. So as radio stations bought other radio stations, they were assigned a value and a portion of that value had to also go back into the radio fund and other funding bodies. As you could guess, there's not many independent radio stations anymore. And even the Shaw-Rogers uh, merger didn't result in any additional funding coming to the Community Radio Fund of Canada. So that organization is working on trying to further find funding because it is in a path uh, timeline that would see it essentially cease to operate by 2030 at this time. And that would pull at this time about $1.5 million in project-based funding out from under the radio stations on an annual basis. So uh, that's one of the other major funding areas that radio stations generate some revenue through. You were talking about revenue being down. Do you mean radio in general, like Bell Rogers Course, or revenue is down for campus and community radio, or is all radio revenue down? Yeah, Don, the, uh, the recent numbers that we're finding are is that revenue overall is down in radio. I think 
most people uh, understand and, and recognize that radio as a platform, although it is still very popular in the car, uh, losing access to that digital dashboard or that interface that people have in their cars when they're able to access their own podcasts or, or music directly as opposed to AM or FM has, has sort of come at a cost to many individuals. But we know that listening numbers are still decently strong and online streaming and podcast numbers are, are very much growing there as well. So what does that mean for groups like the commercial broadcasters, it, it does mean that their revenues are down. Uh, pandemic impacted them the same way it, it, as it did with us. Often local advertising dropped dramatically. People were laid off or uh, forced to work in different other ways. And we've seen that as more and more stations amalgamate together. We're kind of at that point where there's not that many stations left to amalgamate. Uh, the new commercial broadcasting policy was just announced late last year, and it, that even allows for a further integration of these larger networks across the country, which, in our opinion, is going to draw away from local content because there are just fewer and fewer people at local stations and more and more syndicated or programming that's scheduled from outside of the listening area. And again, that's why people are flocking to campus and community radio. Our sector is growing. We're seeing 5 to 8% growth rate on a regular annual basis. And our numbers alone this year up four or five members. And that's just in the first quarter with a handful of others looking to join as well. So as those turn down and, and commercial broadcasters struggle a little bit from the traditional ways, we're seeing both uptake and interest, whether the revenues to support that growth are, are coming our way or not. That's part of the challenge. And of course, with Canadian content development funding tied to those commercial broadcaster successes, we're seeing less and less money available for project-based programming through the Community Radio Fund of Canada. And that's one of the reasons why we've been reaching out to government and saying, hey, if you want us to keep doing the great work that we're doing, uh, we need you to help out with uh, a broadcasting fund to support these stations. So what happened in the last budget? Well, uh, according to most people, not much. We knew that was going to be the case. We knew that this would be an austerity budget, high inflation. One of the big challenges is, of course, if you put money into products and, and projects and so on, well, that creates inflationary spending and it causes inflation to go up. So with that, with coming out of the pandemic, with all the international turmoil that's happening, we knew that the government itself was going to essentially not offer any new types of funding. And that's as pretty much exactly what happened was the entire heritage sector uh, which a lot of the broadcasting falls under, received very little, if if anything else. We had two very specific asks. One is that the Local Journalism Initiative is a program that's going into year five now that hires journalists to work at local levels to report on local information in areas that are called news deserts. So these are spaces that other organizations are not covering. Tete la Belen in uh, Quebec is a tiny little community. They don't have anything there except for now a local journalist who's at council meetings, who's talking with the police, who's dealing with emergency services and, and capturing news and stories from that area to share back to its listeners. There's there's about 40 to 60 of these journalists right now throughout our network. That program itself was actually designed for print. Uh, we were able to, to talk to the government and say, you know, you're missing a huge opportunity because so much news and information comes through radio. And they agreed. They first started with a million dollars in the last year. They've topped that up to another million and a million and a half, I think, in total. So it makes a lot of sense that we're actually making on the ground impacts in these news deserts. So that was one of the things that we were asking for the government to extend and make permanent. It is now in its fifth and final year of funding, unless more funds are brought forth either at the midterm budget in the fall economic update or early next year, we might see those journalists be, be let go because there's just no funding at a lot of these radio stations to be able to keep them on. So that once again, really hurts local news and information when there's nobody that's being paid to cover that. The other ask that we had in place was understanding that we also are 
you know, all the things we've talked about, providing that news and information, providing that local perspective, providing that community development and so on, knowing that the Community Radio Fund of Canada uh, has less and less funds, knowing that the government of Canada does not directly support community or campus radio, which is one of the only countries in the world that doesn't, that we need funding to help with core stable programming. The challenge is many of these radio stations are often worried about fixing a, a, a broadcasting console, making sure there's enough money to keep the generator on when the power goes out because they need to keep broadcasting, and often having somebody there to open the doors so that people can go on the air and share their stories. So we, we were asking for $25 million per year, which would give me approximately $90,000 to every campus community and Indigenous radio station who is licensed by the CRTC on a yearly basis. And this would stabilize the sector so the stations can stop worrying about survival and start worrying about how they can better impact their communities and create better programming. It also comes with a little bit of top-up for the CCD funds. The CRFC is the only organization that doesn't get top-up funding from the government. Factor, Music, uh, Radio Star Maker, a couple of the other groups that receive CCD funding do get supporting matching dollars uh, or, or close to matching dollars from the government of Canada to do their work. We get nothing. And then there's also uh, some money in there for data analysis. So this would be allowing all radio stations to get access to uh, a program called Stats Radio, which tracks the on-air listening numbers and can really validate the work that we do, can then show at this point in time on this radio station, you're getting an estimated X number of listeners. That data analysis and that listener numbers was always outside of the reach of our sector to be able to afford and also was developed through a program called Numeris, which was never designed at all for what we do. So that proposed 25 million would include the ability to put in a study for the sector to then provide more data and more information to validate the work that we do. We know we're doing it. It's really hard to be able to point to numbers and, and showcase exactly where those impacts are made. A lot of great stories, hard to have the real numbers behind it. So that was the other angle of the ask. And within the government budget, both of those uh, did not come through. We were kind of surprised about LJI. It was a mandate letter uh, within one of the, the MPs' mandates about the importance of having news and information and democratic processes and, and all of these continue to strengthen. So we were surprised that that wasn't put through. A little less surprised uh, about the 25 million that we were asking for, but we know that there was a lot of support from members of parliament, from the Royal Caucus, from uh, the Heritage Committee, who have been supporting us through other bills like Bill C-18. Everybody we talk to understands and recognizes now the importance of what we offer. It's just a, a financial game that seems to happen, and unfortunately, Without any of that coming forward, that puts more and more stress on the stations as we're sort of fully coming out of this pandemic. You were talking about wanting more audience data. One of the disadvantages to campus and community radio stations is that we can't really quantify who's listening and when. But we aren't using that data to sell advertising like commercial stations. So I think that makes us different. Is there a danger that if we start using that data the same way as commercial stations that we might lose our way? Well, part of the challenge with data is that, as you sort of said, we don't have anything, right? At Numeris, as an organization, definitely does what it needs to do for the commercial broadcasters. It gives them something that they can point to and say, this is what our listening numbers are and so on. So that's fine. We operate a little different, as we said earlier. Uh, it's more about the community, more about who is listening, uh, but we still need to know that profile of who is listening. So there is a system called Stats Radio, which is something that we're trying to encourage our members to use and something that we're asking government to be able to help us to get access to so we can give back some legitimate numbers. 
obviously organizations, government, not-for-profits, whatever, don't want to be supporting or putting funding towards something that they're not seeing an impact with. We know there's an impact from campus and community radio stations across the country, whether it's in a small town, whether it's in like suburban or urban regions, small, unique pockets, and so on. The challenge, of course, is again, how can we show those numbers? And again, some of those stations are concerned. Uh, Does it mean that if we only have seven listeners, are we actually doing what we're supposed to be doing? And what I turn and say to those stations are is, isn't it better to know how many you have? And there's a starting point so you can adjust and get better. It doesn't have to be sold the same way. Advertising for our sector, as you said, is is sold sort of differently. and, And I don't see that changing. But knowing who your listeners are, is going to be able to help not only the, the the stations themselves make better decisions, but also us at the national level and those who fund everybody a little bit more information. You know, it worries me because our station, like so many other community stations, are really hanging on by our fingernails and the good work and commitment from so many volunteers. So I'm curious, with less funding available, what can stations do? What kind of initiatives have you seen across the country that offset the lack of federal funding? There's a handful of creative ideas when it comes to partnering and and working with organizations. Um, whether that's connecting to local or regional groups to try to share more information and, and, and sort of get the word out about those different types of programs. There's a handful of stations that are working with their, their local community foundations and, and so on to help with that. Obviously, on the music side of things, there's connecting with festivals and, and artists. Stations are converting some studios to podcasting studios or recording studios, just different ways and to try to to try to develop more funding opportunities. One of the really interesting pieces of information, uh, like I said, that we haven't fully announced yet, but we're, we're working on putting out a, a press release on, was that staffing at radio stations for the total number of staff from pre-pandemic to now has actually gone up by about 25%. However, compensation levels paid for for staffing has remained the same. So what that means is that there are more part-time staff and less full-time staff, or there are less people, or there are more people getting paid less to do the work that's happening. And this is offset by approximately 40% reduction in volunteers. So when the pandemic hit, stations lost around two out of every five volunteers just never came back. So they're now working with a lot less volunteers, and a spread out and more thinner staffing model as well. So it's not just, you know, CFRO or some of the small stations. We're seeing this across the the board and the network, and we're even seeing this across uh, sales and advertising opportunities, whereas what used to be decently lucrative back in, you know, the 80s and the 90s, Um, Finding good salespeople who are able to develop those relationships and bring people into radio, that has been shifted again towards more digital purchases and so on. So it it separates more and more from the work that's happening. So there's there's obviously a lot going on in in areas and challenges, and, and the stations are doing their best in order to remain open, venturing for new partnership ideas, looking for new opportunities to generate revenue and so on. But as you sort of alluded to, there's a lot of stations that are sort of on the brink of potentially closing, which we have not seen in the sector. And in fact, we've seen growth because more communities are identifying that they need to have live local information available from their community for their community. So we're seeing growth in that sense but we're also seeing a lot more stations in in very bad financial positions as well. Well, it just means we have to be more creative. And we are. And that's one of the advantages. We're not restricted by the work that, you know, the big boss from up above says, or the head of CBC says, we're going all digital in 10 years. Let's change our platform and and, and all of that. We, we have that flexibility to do what we need to do for the community. And that's that's great. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, in Sackville, New Brunswick, the radio station there 
has embraced podcasting to the sense where not only do they have their radio station, but they also have a community podcast network. So the the station reached out, found everybody who makes a podcast in that community and has brought it all together into one space. So if I want to learn about what's happening, regardless of what the the theme or the format is, anything that's in my area and region is all available in one place, whether it's live on the radio, on demand through the listen back options, through the radio side of things, or on a podcast that I can take with me as well. It's all there. So those are the an example of one of the communities who's really saying, well, let's embrace technology. Let's embrace the way people are consuming uh, media now. And let's take a step forward and, and go that way. I myself have been podcasting since about 2002. So, you know, really early adoption by many different groups has has led the way. What does this mean for AI? Um, who knows? But that's uh, that's another long and interesting discussion that's really just sort of kicking off in, in the media landscape. This radio program and podcast is called The Conversation Lab. I'm Don Schaefer, and you can find this and other episodes at theconversationlab.ca. Today, we're speaking with Barry Rook, who's the executive director of the NCRA the National Campus and Community Radio Association. I was struck by your comment about volunteerism has dipped. And I guess I have two questions. And one is, uh, how do we get more people creatively engaged to develop their stories, their ideas? And how do we get more people to support community or campus radio? Unfortunately, it tends to be that there has to be some sort of trigger to get more people involved. And usually that trigger is someone or something going away, not the opportunity to grow. Uh, we react as opposed to to plan. Um, so new radio stations that start up are often in response to local communities or local commercial stations closing. Stations stepping up to, to generate revenue for an emergency are often tied to an emergency. The transmitter went down because of the hurricane. The fires have knocked out our technical options. We're off the air because we have no power. And communities then tend to step forward with that type of of support. As you said, it's very difficult to to drive people's interest uh, in something that they're doing. And that's why innovation, I think, is really important. That's why sharing the message of what we offer and what the opportunities are at stations is very important. We're seeing... Fewer and fewer students walk into campus stations and say, oh, I want to host a radio show. It's, I want to start a podcast. I want to learn how to do social media for marketing and outreach better. I want to host an event. How do you run the radio station? I'm interested in the finances and the business aspect of it. And that's where you're still driving some interest. But there does need to sort of be that call that we all have what appears to be less and less time because we are all driven by all sorts of different things that take our attention, whether that's video games or new TV shows or the fact that you fell in love with cycling. There's a whole variety of different things that radio is competing with. And the challenge is, as you sort of said, is how do you get people interested in that community media aspect? And there have been pickups where stations definitely have grown and developed new communities around it. But as I said, it's almost always in relation to an emergency or something that has triggered a change as opposed to um, people saying, I want to go make radio. You said that the NCRA is hosting a conference in Calgary. Mm -hmm. Can you can you talk about what happens at a conference, what you hope to see happen? Uh, the first thing is, is we get people together and they get an opportunity to meet and, and see their peers. So this is often in our network where there's not often that much of an opportunity to do so outside of online and 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 chatting with each other. Or sometimes you, you phone up another radio station and say, hey, do you have a solution for this or so? It's bringing everybody together. Um, and it's really a meeting point. And we've learned that although the training sessions on how to become better at making sales or what's the future of the sector or hearing a talk from a CRTC who is our keynote this year are valuable. It's often the spaces between, right? That water cooler discussions where you say, well, you said something about 
you had a challenge with this volunteer who did this. We had a similar experience. And, and then suddenly those two people go off and, you know, in the evening and they spend the whole night talking about what happens and how to make positive changes for it. It's a really interesting and creative space to be involved in as well. Uh, it's one of those times where you're there for about three, four days. We have our national awards. And by the end of that fourth day, you're going, I am so tired but I am so, so excited to try to get back to work on Monday because the ideas and the passion just reignites. And we've tried to expand that program so that we're now offering what's called the Station Manager Summit, um, where we bring the heads of stations together and they have those discussions as well. And again, in, in that format, it's a two-day sit-together. We usually have one or two presentations, a little keynote but it's about six or seven hours of everybody sitting in a room and then someone says, all right, who has a question? What do you want to talk about? This theme for this hour is on finances. And they'll, as a group, simply explore what's challenging, what's working, what's not working, what are the fears, what are some great ideas. And as a collective, like communities do, they come up with creative solutions or ideas to move towards. And it's, it's, it's really invigorating. We talked about uh, some of the things on the horizon. Uh, certainly funding was one. Uh, you talked a little bit about podcasting and the impact some stations are having by, by exploring that. What are some of the other things that you see as future issues for campus and community radio stations? We've talked a little bit, too, about volunteer challenges. We've talked a little bit yep. about digital transformation. Where I'm seeing a lot of the future of going is using technology as ways to better support the stations so that they can create content, share that content, and have their voices heard amongst the Spotify's and the YouTubes of the world. We are trying to focus more and more on the importance of data and utilizing data from within our networks and from other areas as a way to create decisions or plans going forward. So for example, listener numbers, statistics often scare radio stations. They're concerned that, oh, my afternoon show has seven listeners, says data. That is a possibility. It's most likely under uh, what you think it is. And it also gives you ideas and options to how to be able to expand upon that. So um, I think data-driven solutions is a lot of where we're looking at in the future, whether that's technology that helps you get content or distribute content or share information about that content back to who gave it to you. As someone who was doing syndicated radio shows, yes, I knew my show was on 30 stations, and I could estimate a listening audience. But if I actually knew which stations were playing it, how many listeners were happening, I could then, as an artist, figure out, should I be going there to travel? Oh, this song seemed to be way more popular than that song. Maybe I need to shift how I do some of my own music production. As an advertiser, this type of ad campaign worked better than that ad campaign. Why? Because more people went to that concert and when we ran it at night versus, you know, in the early mornings. Those types of data and information points to make decisions, I think, are, are becoming more and more important um, for the sector as we figure out where we are going in the future. What kind of changes do you expect uh, at the CRTC or with the Broadcasting Act? Uh, interesting changes. Um, I think that the flexibility of what they're hoping for with that process is going to allow organizations to better operate so that your your conditions of your license are just are there. So it's a lot less worried about, oh, are we going to get our license pulled or this or that? The answer is, well, we need to work towards uh, doing this and keep doing that better. We think that there is going to be more changes. Uh, the discussion around Canadian content has slightly changed and is still open for discussions. Uh, the Canadian content development funding was specifically set aside until after the Broadcasting Act was brought uh, was was run through. Um, so the CRTC will have to sort of circle back to that. Um, we also know that there is going to be this discussion around content 
whether it how it applies to non-traditional broadcasters like online and so on. Uh, that's through C11 and through C18 um, around news and information and and access and 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 you know organizations and companies like Google and Facebook paying for the content that is on their network that they get for free through broadcasters or others. It's called the Australian model. We're not going to go into that discussion. But if you want some interesting, you know, to see how big companies and big business pushes back for news and information is it those are all things that are in the forefront that when the Broadcasting Act in 1990 was was uh, passed, there's no idea that those discussions were going to be there. So I think we'll see changes in the landscape changes in technology those are going to impact the the you know the operations that the CRTC does and the realm in which it oversees uh, which is an interesting space to be in because they're as an organization historically underfunded um, to do the work that they need to do as well so it's um there will be obviously some changes I'm hoping we won't see commercial and for-profit organizations try to take advantage of any, um, you know, loopholes and so on. I expect that to happen. But I'm also hoping that people continue to recognize the importance and value of what our sector provides at that local level when those services just aren't available anywhere else. We're mostly talking about campus and community radio stations. With the new technology uh, and knowing how onerous the licensing process is to apply for and get a radio station, why would you go through that process and not just go online? We're seeing more of that happen. Um, We're seeing more and more community organizations come together and say, we need a voice to be able to be heard. However, I have no interest in being licensed by the CRTC because I can be heard through digital technologies, whether that's online streaming, podcasting, etc. We have a couple of community radio stations that just joined the NCRA that have no goal at all to get that license. So what does that do for them? Well, they still have to follow copyright rules. They still have to pay for copyright tariffs to be able to put on the air, etc. But what it doesn't mean is they don't have to meet requirements through Canadian content levels, through broadcasting, etc. They obviously can't be putting forth hate speech and all of these other types of areas that, you know, the CRTC licenses and oversees. But these stations and communities already understand the importance of making sure that there's those options are and that's, that's covered, that democratic process is covered. So it just becomes slightly easier to set something up. That's Where we design our line is around individual expression versus a collective community. So in order to become a member of the NCRA, you must have a not-for-profit designation, whether it's a society or a not-for-profit incorporation, depending on your province, and you must have volunteer uh, access to the airwaves. So you can't just, you know, you and two friends start up a for-profit company and start broadcasting and say whatever you want to say. That's where we've got that divided line. That's where a lot of C11 um, on the uh, government discussion was happening was what is that line? Because they were concerned that some of these new requirements from C11 were going to take away personal freedom of expression. The government was going to come after you because you said you didn't like X, Y, and Z, and they're going to take your license and they're going to steal your computer and they're going to throw you in jail. And there's a lot of rumblings around you know, those types of areas. And that's, I think, a bit where C11 and C18 are trying to create that dividing line. And that's, again, where we're seeing where we fit with that sort of process. And it's interesting being someone that has been involved in not-for-profit um, for now 20 years. It's uh, it's really interesting to see that there's a, just a different mentality on how organizations and people work and and within that sphere. And if you've been involved with not-for-profits and and the governance of that process, you see the beauty on the democratic process, the community involvement, et cetera, whereas other organizations often are blinded by either something they're trying to do, fame or fortune, or 
in their case, hopefully both. And that's just a different mentality on how people operate. So sort of <laughs> swayed away from your, your conversation there as well. But I think that's really important to, to, to talk about as well. Yeah, I think the word you were looking for earlier was compliance. The uh, online radio station doesn't necessarily have the same compliance obligations that a licensed station has. But it shouldn't rule out the opportunity if they're willing to do the right things for the right reasons. If their their goals are stated and that it's community based, we want you to succeed. Yeah. And that's why we're we're encouraging that. And we're seeing more and more people, more and more stations who are online only joining our association because of the resources we have in those communities that we can help them reach better. Last two questions. First, uh, what keeps you up at night? Well, that's a good one. I'll have to think about that overnight. <laughs> okay. Uh, final question is, what haven't we talked about that we should? I think maybe we haven't touched on the fact that we're at an opportunity where the work that our stations do and the broadcasters do really has a way to help to keep us connected with the communities. We touched a little bit about it, but I don't think as much. I think as parting, I would say the way in which the radio stations and their broadcasters connect and share the passion that the communities that they live in, I think is really important to remember that that's how humans typically operate. I like to think we as a society are working towards helping our fellow um, humans or animals or, or environment. And it, it's uplifting as opposed to, to bringing you down, working in the sector and being involved in the sector. So I think most people, if you haven't done any volunteering or been involved in the organizations at the local level or, or, or beyond that, just getting your toe in there and, and learning a little bit, you'll find that Again, the reason why I've always enjoyed working in this sector is because the people are great. The communities are trying to, to just do better. And that's a really positive thing to be involved in and working with, especially with all the negativity that we have in our world these days. And producing radio programs or podcasts is so much fun. Barry, I really want to thank you for uh, hanging out with us. And we've learned so much about community and campus radio stations and the good work they do all across Canada. Well, thank you, Don. And I really appreciate the fact that you took the time to reach out and chat because uh, you, like thousands of others across the country, are the reasons why uh, radio is, is what it is for the community level and close by. It's providing that opportunity to share an experience and bring everyone together. So, so thank you again. We've been talking with Barry Rook. He's the executive director of the NCRA, the National Community and Campus Radio Association that supports 126 radio stations just like this one all across Canada. If you want to support a program you like, volunteer, or maybe do a program of your own, you can contact Barry at ncra.ca or this station. The Conversation Lab is produced by CFRO-FM in Vancouver's downtown Eastside on the territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Our gratitude and thanks to them as well as the many nonprofit organizations, community groups, and change makers around the world that support this program. If you have a story to share or know someone who does, please have them contact us at this radio station, theconversationlab.ca, and on many social media and podcasting platforms. This episode was cobbled together with some help from Ann Watson, Kim and Sekon, John Massacar, and Julian Anton, with music by Jason Shaw. Thanks, guys.